Good evening. I'd like to call to order the May 5th, 2020 Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee at let's see, 5.01 p.m. Um, my name is Ann Hovey and I'm chair of the DSRSC. This open meeting of the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee is convening via Zoom app as posted. Information on how to join our school committee meetings and meeting agendas are posted on the Dover Sherburn District website and on town calendars. Please note the meeting is being recorded and anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. For public comment, pub community comments are an opportunity for members of the community to be heard. We respectfully request that you please make your comments brief, about two to three minutes, and that you move the discussion forward by adding new information. Please try to avoid repeating points that have already been made as possible. For community comments, please virtually raise your hand and wait to be called on. When you speak, please begin by stating your name and street address. Community comments are an opportunity for us to listen to members of the community. It's not a forum for answering questions or engaging in a debate. Once the public comment section of the meeting has been concluded, we'll move on to other business and unsolicited comments from the community will no longer be permitted. This is standard operating procedure in school committee meetings across our three districts. We invite everyone to stay and listen to the entire meeting, but also understand you may not be able to do so and you may leave the Zoom call at any time. We appreciate that you've taken the time to participate in this most important process and encourage you to reach out to your school committee reps at any time. And a quick reminder to the school committee members, please remember to virtually raise your hand when you'd like to, when you'd like to speak and always begin by stating your name. Dan, can I add one thing? Yes. Um, it's Andrew. So the chat um, feature has been disabled, so they can't really virtually raise their hand unless they use the reactions such as that. No, you can raise, if you're an under participants, like I see right now, I have, I see the list of participants and my oh, in participants. Okay. Sorry. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, okay. My mistake. No Perfect. worries. I appreciate you bringing that up. Cause if that had been the case, that would have been a problem. Um, and, uh, and also to the extent, uh, we're going to be seeing your big picture a lot. Um, I don't know if it's another cat on your computer, but your, uh, your monitor shaking. So oh, sorry. That's, that's me. I, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, that is you. Yep, that's me. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, you can also not put me on big. I'd appreciate it if you didn't. In fact, I just see lots of little boxes. So maybe that's an option and y'all can try that. Maybe. Um, before we get on to the rest of the business of the meeting, I'd like to say a few quick words. All right. Um, and this has been looked at by all the members of the school committee. As has been said over and over again, we're in uncharted territory. It's really challenging for everyone in a myriad of ways. People are used to seeing, we are, people we're used to seeing every day are facing difficulties and obstacles about which we may not even be aware. We are all in uncharted territory, many of us facing monumental, potentially life-changing circumstances, and most of us are under an inordinate amount of stress. But even in this time of adversity, in fact, because of this time of adversity, it's important to remember that we are all trying to do the best we can. In terms of our school district, we're all trying to do the best we can for our students. We may not always agree, and that's okay, but what we disagree about are the details. We all agree that the common goal is to do the best that we can for our students, our teachers, our district, and our community. Thank you to the many parents who have taken on a much greater role in their child's education and who have reached out to support others as we learn about blended learning together. The community support during this time has been truly incredible. Thank you to administrators, staff, and everyone else who have gone above and beyond to make sure the district keeps running smoothly and that our students and families are safe and provided for during the crisis. You may be behind the scenes, but your efforts are valued and appreciated. Most importantly, this is teacher, National Teacher Appreciation Week. At this time, I'd like to express a heartfelt thanks to all our children's teachers who are taking on new challenges to teach and more importantly, to connect with our students. You are truly the heart of this school and we appreciate all that you do. You are respected, you are loved, and we are grateful for all that you do this week and every week. The 
cliched phrase that it takes a village to raise a child is particularly relevant right now. As this crisis enters each new phase, let's continue to work together to support each other in our efforts to do the best we can for our students and for our teachers and for each other. Thank you. All right, now to community comments. Are there any community comments? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Double check. All right, so no, nope. all right, moving on then, we're gonna to go to reports and let's start with Mr. John Smith. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Hovey and members of the Regional School Committee and um, thank you for your kind words. And I also wanna pass along my uh, sincere thank you and gratitude to the Regional School Committee for your support of our educators, uh, administrators, and everybody. Um, I wrote in my reflections that I am truly grateful to work in such a supportive community and a caring community, and that does not go unnoticed, um, and so a thank you. We have been, you know, really busy at the high school uh, in, a, in a completely different manner than what we're accustomed. Um, we are now in our phase three of remote learning where we are looking at you know streamlining communication and really focusing in on the power standards um, as Ms. McCoy has um, guided us through looking at DESE's recommendations and those power standards are the key components that our students will need to know not just content but skill based that they'll need to know moving into their next set of courses uh, for our seniors, they only have a few short weeks. I'm very pleased to say we were still able to have senior projects, uh, which is great. We had about 48 students still participating, some of which were able to do their original idea because it did involve social distancing. Thank you to a number of staff members who came up with other proposal ideas. We actually have four students working on end of year returning of books and supplies and materials. So a kind of a great problem solving portrait of a graduate. We have others who are looking at things such as um, paying collegiate athletes on um, the pros and cons of that. We have some students who are doing some PSAs for on e-cigarettes and the dangers of um, the electronic uh, tobacco industry and they'll be doing promotion. So uh, I did want to give a shout out to Miss Clancy and to Miss Bishop who in addition to their teaching responsibilities have really taken the lead in this. Uh, and for all of those mentors who continue to allow our seniors to have that senior project experience, clearly our seniors are the ones that we feel the worst for. They are the ones who are uh, missing out on some end of year activities and some big things. That being said, Ms. Keegan and I and the faculty and Dr. Keogh and Ms. McCoy, um, we are determined to do something really nice for the seniors. So we are continuing to communicate with seniors. I've had several Zooms. We put out a survey for all of our seniors to gather some ideas as to what they would like to see in a graduation. I've been very honest with them and have told them that, you know, it's not going to be the traditional graduation that we have seen in past years, but that doesn't mean we can't do something special. Um, I think we want to take it beyond just a virtual graduation. I think we want to try to do something that involves our campus. Um, nothing is set in stone yet, and we're even being willing to consider pushing things off later into June with the hope of some restrictions being eased a bit and for us to be able to look at some different options of what we can do. Obviously, uh, before any decisions are made, we will bring forth proposals to the Superintendent of Schools and the Regional School Committee for your review and approval. Um, but we still want to ensure that our seniors are sent off um, as they should be uh, and congratulated. On top of that, we are still planning on submitting senior awards to students as we are for uh, junior book awards. I think our underclassmen awards, we obviously won't be having a large ceremony, but we still are working with teachers to acknowledge those underclassmen uh, and the work that they've done in their specific classes, probably acknowledgement through a letter, and then when students do return next fall, they could receive the certificate. 
we thought it was important to still acknowledge them this year while it's still fresh and also as an opportunity for those students who do receive awards, something that they can be putting into their um, resumes and their activity files for their college applications. So between the graduation, senior awards, um, looking at some underclassmen pieces, and then also having our eye to the future, uh, we'll be working with Scott Kellett and the eighth graders in ensuring that there's a transition plan for uh, students who will be joining us in the fall in some shape or form. Uh, I am in contact with the peer leaders who typically are the ones who run the orientation program on top of guidance. Um, so a lot of balls in the air, uh, still a lot of things to be determined and a lot of things will depend upon our local boards of health, our Department of Public Health, governor's orders, um, obviously the regional school committee and the superintendent's office, uh, but please know that um, from a perspective of serving our seniors, we wanna make sure that we do something um, that is nice and memorable uh, and special so that they can be um, proud of, of their school and their system and their experience and then move on to uh, greener pastures. That's it for me, Ms. Hovey. Um, thank you. Um, can I just really quickly, if people haven't had a chance to look, go through the links that provided, that the guidance office provided, um, there's a lot of great info, especially for juniors about the college process. Um, and if you know people who have expressed some anxiety about that, really informative. Um, it's also worth a look just to see Mr. O'Mara's tie-dye t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, um, but really, really informative. They have a com he has a conversation with like six or seven guidance uh, admissions officers and colleges, what colleges are saying about the impact of COVID-19 on their transcripts, all of that really, really useful info. Yeah. And if I may, Ms. Hovey, they are also conducting um, Zoom sessions for parents as we speak uh, simultaneously to our meeting tonight. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll ask you this about Mr. Ask Mr. Kellett later. Maybe this you've thought about this, but um, I know next month we're looking at the school improvement plans. Um, yes. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about like some of the big topics that that will address. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we awesome. had an excellent school council meeting yesterday, and. Um, we know that for sure our focus areas, one will be with our new start time next year, the flex block, and looking at the multiple purposes of that flex block, which would include academic support, um, academic organization, teacher connection, uh, advisory, uh, and um, in some cases opportunities for some um, groups to meet, you know, to provide some peer uh, leader work and world of difference work with some of our student population. So there will certainly be a goal. Uh, we have rough draft crafted now of um, the flex block and how that will be implemented for our students. Another one, another goal will center around our NIAS visit, which is coming up in October. It's a little, there, there, it may be subject to change on NIAS and I think we're ready to roll. Uh, but they did have a backlog because schools that they were expected to visit this spring, they obviously had to cancel. Um, Mr. Kaplan, Ms. Donahue, and I attended a uh, Zoom webinar with Fran Kennedy from NEASC, and were given sort of the overview. Um, Ms. Fittori in the business office has already worked with me to secure hotel lodging and all of that. So we're in, we're in good shape there and our documents will be ready. It'll be probably more of a matter of, will NIAS prioritize us coming in the fall? If not the fall, the spring. So to have a goal will still be important. And what's great about NEASC is a lot of their 2020 standards tie directly into the portrait of a graduate and some of the key uh, indicators that we have there. So we're gonna have a combined NEASC portrait or graduate goal that will address um, issues uh, around portrait or graduate, but also address the components of our strategic plan, which will be going into next year, another, another year. And then the um, 
The last one that we're going to be looking at will be um, some additional work around cultural responsiveness, some continuation. We, we are having some conversations about, will that just be something that we do instead of being another separate goal? So we're discussing that. And a great discussion that we had yesterday was around the concept of, of anticipating potential changes for next fall with our attendance and looking at some type of blended learning goal in case we do have to start school in a staggered or sort of a different uh, paradigm. Um, those those will, be will be our, our areas of focus. And Mr. Smith, if I can add one, one um, item. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry, I, I and can. we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, you can, sorry. Can you just make sure that uh, you get recognized, A, but B, also state your name at the beginning. Just, we'll try Michael to get Jaffe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the other thing that uh, um, I, I uh, would recommend to the group, uh, to the, the, uh, the SAC, um, is to um, be mindful of potentially getting overwhelmed uh, with the, the blended learning um, goal. And so maybe we would see something that's a little bit flexible. So it may be if there is a, uh, an unusual learning environment next year, which is very possible, that one of those goals may end up getting pushed off to the following academic year, uh, and then the others would be reprioritized. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. That was really actually very thorough, very helpful. I look forward to seeing those next month. Great, thank you, Ms. Hoppy. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Kellett. Good evening, how are you, Ms. Hubby? And other members of the school committee. I want to re reiterate what uh, Mr. Smith said about our appreciation on behalf of Mr. Robleski, myself, and the staff for all the support that both Central Office and this uh, Regional School Committee has has given us. It's, um, it is much appreciated and we can't thank you enough. Um, in my, in our report, I, I tried to, I reached out to the uh, team leaders and curriculum leaders and tried to give you a sense of what's being done to support students in the remote learning environment. So there's a number of things that are happening that uh, I hope you have the opportunity to read about. And if you have any questions, please ask. Um, I did wanna make sure that I mentioned our scholar leaders. Um, NELMS, New England League of Middle Schools, did not have the scholar leader dinner program this year. And usually we're limited to two students. Uh, we had three students, two students um, came, it was tied in the voting, so we are able to recognize three students this year, and we're very pleased. Uh, there are a host of students in our eighth grade class who could have been chosen, but these three students stood out. Um, they, they are Karina Scalar, William Goldman, and Margaret Bowles. Um, it, they're for leadership, community service, and um, just being there for others. Uh, so congratulations to them. I wanted to mention the uh, Mr. Robleski and I have been working with um, music folks, Mr. Herman, we talked about him before the meeting even started, and world language. And we, Mr. Robleski was able, using his, his skills from a past life, was able to put together a virtual presentation for the transition of fifth grade students to the middle school. And we shared that with both parents and students, fifth grade parents and students. And then last Friday, he and I had uh, Q&A sessions after they had a chance to watch the um, presentations. We had Q&A sessions to allow them to ask us any questions that they, they might have. He is, he is now working on putting together a virtual tour of the middle school in Link was Commons so that we can share that with students as, as they won't be able to visit us when our eighth graders would have been in DC. Um, I, I have to give a huge shout out to Kathy Malloy and Donna Bettigan, our eighth grade team leaders, um, all of our team leaders, but these two on top of the, re the blended learning, remote learning we're doing, they had, um, had to deal with 
getting straightened up, getting getting straightened away the DC trip, and now they're in. The, we had a call earlier today to talk about how we can recognize our eighth grade students as they exit the middle school. Um, and, and we have some ideas on that and, and we'll be bringing those forward to Dr. Keogh in the near future. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, Kathy Malloy, her CAG is still up and running. If you haven't seen their virtual talent show, it is worth, it is worth a few minutes to, uh, to click on that link at the end of our, our report. Um, and I think that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. Kellett. I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Mr. Smith, um, since we're gonna be looking at the school improvement plan next month, if you have a sneak preview for us of some of the big items sure. that you think you'll be touching on. Be well, awesome. there's a host and, and um, one of the ones I have written in front of me is, is, is flexibility, which includes a number of things uh, that would be a blended learning environment, uh, and a, a possible hybrid schedule, um, and probably most importantly in that as we hopefully return to school is student wellness and, and being able to uh, make sure that they're in a, in a good place to learn um, however our schedule is is built and that would include us looking at advisory and how we might incorporate that into H block. Um, I don't know if there'd be a possibility and I haven't even talked to Mr. Smith about using some high school students to be part of that. It might be a way to blend the flex block. Um, we also have to be, you know, we have one of our big ones will be our one-to-one -one initiative with the Chromebooks, uh, which fits nicely with the portrait of a graduate. Um, and along with that would be it it's in our um in the handbook changes is the mastery rubrics that the special subjects are looking to continue to pilot and those fit really nicely with our with our portrait of a graduate and our world language teachers are creating their own rubrics for theirs will be more of a proficiency uh rubrics to assess students so those that's that would be our maiden focuses. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that. Questions, people question. Maggie? Um, hang on. Yeah. So uh, my question is sort of to both John and, and Scott. And um, I think um, I just wanted to say, first of all, a thank you. And that's to all, all the school administrators and all the teachers, um, particularly around this idea of the phase three or phase last of the um, DS remote learning plans. Um, I um, experienced this week, and I think a lot of families did, sort of an increased um, communication from my own child's teachers. Um, I got a, you know an email from each of them, kind of really laying out what's going to be going on for the rest of the year. And um, I also understand that there are sort of more sort of live opportunities for kids to um, engage with their teachers. And I'm just wondering um, if either or both of you could just speak to that, um, because I do think that that's something that families were asking for, and it definitely came through loud and clear um, for, for this one family this weekend, and, and I'm hoping that maybe you could share a little bit with us, because um, it, it definitely added some structure to our family life that was awesome, so thank you. Um, any Anything that you could share with us about that? Sure. Um, sure. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead, Scott. Uh, the, the middle school is, is going to continue with their, the Zoom check-ins that they have scheduled okay. on a weekly basis. And those will be, the focus of those will be mostly to check in with the students and, and their well-being, and also to do um, question and answer on, on material that they've been assigned and that the teachers have created um, either links or mini lessons for them to to watch before um, undertaking the work that was assigned. Um, and they're also um, looking to create more opportunities to do either individual uh, Zooms with students to help them or to do extra help sessions where they could have a group of students in that, in that session. Terrific. So at the high school, Ms. Sharon, we have requested all faculty to uh, reach out to families and to students and sort of um, reiterate what will be expected for this remaining phase 
uh, kind of an update, looking at those power standards, acknowledging, you know, the, the fact that come fall, we'll have to look and see, you know, are there some, some things that we do need to review or some things that we need to work through. Uh, in addition, we've also recommended uh, for our advisors of different clubs and activities to increase their reach out. Uh, we feel as though our students are certainly craving that, but also I think are able to handle for that. Um, we, in some cases, um, some of our, our um, administration is doing something like that. I've been doing some Zooms with seniors um, and we'll continue doing those. Ms. Keegan is also doing some academic planning uh, meetings that involve usually a teacher, Ms. Keegan, and then a member of guidance, especially if students are having some struggles or difficulties. And in those cases, we also involve the parent. So we're having kind of a, a virtual team meeting um, and they don't necessarily have to be a special education student, it's just in general um, to sort of work through that. What's working for you? What's not working for you? How can we further support you? Kind of explaining the expectations. Um, I've clarified with our student population the expectations around um, attending the Zooms and knowing that there will be some times where they can't and all you have to do is just simply reach out to your teachers and say, you know, we had a conflict bunch of people on the same computer or whatever the case may be. Part of it is we just feel like that increased attendance will really help with engagement as well. Well, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you. Um, and, and that's just also behalf on, on behalf of the community and, and some folks that um, weren't able to you know, come to these meetings, but definitely are seeing that. And um, I know it takes a lot of work on the part of you know, folks to be available at these times and it's a lot to juggle. So um, thank you and to all the different folks that all put in the work to make that roll out. Um, Ms. McCoy, um, Dr. Keo, and all the teams around you are really, really, we appreciate it. And um, we're hopeful that the next seven weeks are going to be a really thoughtful, fruitful time for everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Does anybody else have questions? Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Smith, Mr. Kellett. We'll get back to you later in the agenda again. Um, oh, actually, no, it's next. It's the next is the consideration of remote learning grading. So I would love to hear, John, do you want to go first? With yeah, yeah, certainly. Okay, great, so thanks. we've spent a good bit of time sort of analyzing, you know, where we are with this. And, and we didn't move on it right away simply because we really didn't know if we'd be back in school. You know, we kind of had to wait based upon the, the governor and those sorts of decisions. So looking at the full picture, we, we essentially had a full semester one, a regular semester one with two quarters and a mid-year exam. And then we had six weeks of academic time of the 10 weeks of quarter three. And so we also wanted to ensure uh, that that time was accounted for. Interesting enough, when this process was going through and we were contemplating what to do, I received several emails, as did several teachers from students saying, you know, please find a way to include those six weeks into um, the grading piece uh, and don't just involve them all into quarter four because we, we want that to be given its due weight. So that was part of my thinking. We also examined a number of different models similar to Dr. Keogh and Ms. McCoy and Ms. Fattori. I have Java-like groups with other principals that I meet with once a week and this was obviously a very hot topic uh, to discuss, you know, how would we handle something like this. Um, under the regular system, we made an adjustment actually. We scaled back our mid-years and our finals and um, the each term is now worth about 22.5% as opposed to 20%. Um, so we put more emphasis on the quarterly grades and less on the mid-years and finals. We uh, batted around a number of different ones and, and came to the propose that you had, the proposal you have in front of you of looking at term one um, being, I mean, um, semester one being 72%, and that what that incorporates is term one, term two, and the mid-year exam. Um, 
we based it on 36, 36% 36 each with the mid-year being folded into, you know, those two terms. So about 72%. Term three would be 18%, which would be uh, a little bit over um, about half of what would be a regular quarter. And then term four would be 10%. And on face value, it looks as though, wow, okay, term uh, semester one is going to be really heavily weighted. It is going to be more heavily weighted. However, it does two different things. It does give us that opportunity to put forward grades when all resources were in place, teachers had academic support, students could access the learning center, uh, you know, co compensatory services were being conducted. It was sort of the real school picture. Term three had those six weeks, so we felt as though term three needed to be a little bit higher in weight than term four. What term four can do for students is actually give them a boost. So term four being 10% doesn't sound like a lot, yet students can get that full 10%. The majority, almost all of our students are gonna get that 10%. And what that equates to is 100. And if you think about it, students probably in many of their courses are not receiving 100. They might be receiving a 93, a 94, a 95, maybe even a 96, 97. But to say that they're going to get 100 across the board on each of their courses within that 10% will help students who either A, had a, um, a slower start to the year or struggled a little bit first semester, and it gives them a real boost. Our intention is to provide all students, as long as they engage in the work and complete the work, they're going to receive the 10%, the 100 points for that as opposed to a student who, say, in a regular school year, you know, could have completed everything, took a test, maybe got an 82, you know, so it's going to be an all or none, and it sounds like, oh, well, what about the none? Well, we're working so that we don't have any students who are in that case, and that's where we're providing these academic planning meetings. We also are going to be allowing students in term three who had some makeup work. So let's say you were a student who was out, you had missed a quiz, you had missed a test or a project. We're going to give them a window of time to make that work up. And we're working individually with, once we have a, 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 an approved grading program, our teachers will be working out to those students and explaining to them, okay, you did miss a test on such and such. We're, I'm going to work with you on that where they might translate it to a project-based assessment instead of a, a test, but they'll give them the opportunity to boost their grade for term three as well. So there's two different places where they can boost it. They can boost it within their term three, and they can also receive the full 100-point credit for term four. So that's what our proposal is. Um, most schools uh, that are comparable schools, Wayland, Westwood, uh, Wellesley, Wellesley is actually doing this exact one. Um, are looking at the percentages of term one, term two, and the mid-year being a little bit higher than the other ones, simply because it's the brick and mortar educational experience that we're accustomed to. I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, explain um, you know, the process. I, I can tell you that we batted this around with guidance, with department chairs. We also sent it out to teachers for their feedback. And after working out a couple things with Aspen, because we had to make sure that this would work with them, um, this is what the faculty would like to move forward with. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah Lynn, go ahead. Can, can you speak to what, what um, options you looked at and why you chose this approach over other options? Yeah, because we, we we looked at options that would certainly be like maybe a quarter three, quarter four, roll it into one and just have second half of the year be pass fail. Um, but the feedback from students was they wanted that work to count that they had done in term three. We also looked at percentages um, that would make third and fourth quarter a little closer than first and second quarter but faculty felt and guidance felt as though 
the true educational experience and students having full access took place when they were in school. Lynn, do you have further questions? Is that, um, that no, I think, he, I think he answered them. Yep, you answered them. Okay, Judy? Yeah, this is just a point of information. Are you going to have finals this year? We are not. Okay. I, that's, <laughs> that's good. No finals. Kate has her hand up. Yep, yep Kate. Kate? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for explaining that. That was very helpful. Um, and can you explain, I know the goal is to hopefully um, have everybody receiving the, the passing grade in 100% for the fourth quarter, but can you speak a little bit more to how you might be identifying kids who um, might present as though they're doing no work and, and how we can I mean, I know we're a small district and the teachers are checking in through Zoom, but we don't really know what's going on in each home and some situations are really hard. Can you just speak a little bit to how you're hoping to identify those kids? Absolutely. So as part of our GNA, which is guidance and administration, and we meet twice a week, um, we have what's called an engagement tracker. It's an internal document that we use. Teachers at the end of each week are requested to provide input for any students who didn't complete work and to what that was and to give us feedback you know each week if they had not if it was just a matter of they didn't complete one thing and you know they reached out to that particular student students going to work on it it was given a lower priority our top priority went to students who um, we saw multiple cases where they did not engage with teachers across the board, across a bunch of their subjects. So that internal document is then used by the guidance department and administration to reach out and to have those academic planning meetings that I was talking about that Ms. Keegan uh, yep. set up. And so for example, she has three tomorrow. And the goal in those cases is it's open-ended with kids we're not saying that at the end of the week you didn't complete that assignment you can't do that assignment you can still complete that assignment and it's not being graded for a specific grade It's being graded for completion uh, we've also said to some teachers if a student didn't satisfactorily um, complete an assignment give it back to them for revision and give them the opportunity with support to redo it uh, so that they get the completion portion of it. Once again, it's not given as a grade. A couple of our AP teachers have given some mock grades, but that's more of just to gauge where they might be prior to going into the exam. Mm -hmm. um, so that tracker has been very, very successful. The fact that we also meet twice a week on those GNAs and what we discuss are students who uh, teachers are reporting have not engaged. The guidance counselors actually reach out to the families. The teachers are also requested to not only email the student, but to email the parent if it's more than one time that they have not turned something in, just to make them aware. Um, in some of the cases, kids, um, you know, there have been some, a, a variety of things, but some of it has been the student was telling mom or dad that they were doing the work and they were not, or they were struggling with the delivery of how it was being done and then we need to look at a different way and so we go back to the teacher to say okay i need you now to uh, either give an alternative assignment or to explain a different way that that student can can learn the material okay thank you it sounds like that's um very individualized for the students which i think is great and and one great thing about being such a small district yep uh, yeah. And especially now, because as you said, maybe someone's just not completing the assignments, but maybe they're working or caring for a grandparent or younger siblings. It, it Things are so different now than they normally are. So I, I appreciate everybody's yeah. efforts. I would say guidance is is involved with this in a much sooner, earlier process than they would if it were in the brick and mortar. Uh, mm -hmm. school environment simply because we know that there can be so many other factors involved because of what is taking place and because of the isolation and and how it presents itself for different uh, families yeah thank you, thank you.
Uh, Mr. Ja <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Jaffe. Thanks, Sam. Um, I, I have a number of uh, uh, questions, comments, um, and, and concerns, I guess, uh, around the policy um, or the, the proposed policy. It's thank you for, for putting it out. It's, it's obvious that um, there's a lot of thought put into how do we do the right thing um, and how do we create a policy that seeks to strike a balance between the in-class learning um, and a portion weight based on the amount of, of content uh, delivery. Um, I, I did um, speak with a number of uh, uh, community members, parents, and, and collected some feedback, which for me helped frame uh, some, of, some of my considerations. And, and I, I'd like to get the indulgence to maybe kind of uh, uh, read from some of those to get a little bit of the flavor of the feedback that I received. Would that be okay? Okay, I'll just kind of go yeah, yeah, go, just go, go, go down a, a, a number of bullets. So the 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 kind of the, the 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 main messaging I received back was around um, uh, around doing right by by students, um, and there's some concern around that. Uh, so some of the the quotes: students have been promised over over and over again that they will not be harmed. Uh, another states do no harm is a good mantra, and I think the proposed policy will end up doing harm to some students, um, psychologically, if nothing else. Uh, a third said, do no harm should be the guiding principle. Um, another comment, I think the 72% weighting is a huge mistake. Uh, quarters should be equally weighted regardless of distant learning, uh, should not modify student expectations retroactively as it takes away student power. Uh, students should be able to decide between credit, no credit, or a grade based on 25% quarterly rated weighting at the end of the year, um, should create a policy that has less downside and addresses some of the proposed policy shortcomings. Uh, an alternate policy um, could empower more students to stay engaged throughout the end of the school year. If students feel that they can only increase um, their, their grades, their GPAs with additional effort and engagement, they may be encouraged to remain hopeful. Um, a lot of kids look at the third and fourth quarters as catch-up. I know mine always have, especially when you factor in sports or drama production into the equation. Um, there should be an alternate to pass-fail in order to motivate kids and keep them engaged. This isn't just about getting through the year. It's also consistently developing study and engagement habits. Uh, a lot of kids take a while to learn the teaching style and expectations of the teacher and uh, how that is reflected in their grade. So that's kind of the flavor of, of, of some of the comments. Um, I abbreviated those. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, the, the lens that I've thought about the policy through, which I think is quite consequential for, for our, uh, our students, um, is that it should be as, as equitable, flexible, and in the overall best interest of the students as, as possible. Um, and when I was thinking about kind of unintended consequences, it's very difficult to create a, a, a perfect policy. I, I think it's probably impossible uh, in, with these circumstances and when the, the time constraints we have. Um, I'm personally more interested in protecting potential student downside unintended consequences than protecting potent against potential student unjust enrichment. Um, and so kind of in, in sum, um, I, I, I think the, 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 the mantra or the overarching principle of, of do no harm um, and, and try to, to the maximum extent possible, create opportunities for students to achieve a, a great result that they may have been otherwise uh, been able to achieve had we had a traditional year um, ought to be ought to be the the goal. Um, and with the uh, the the kind of binary ten percent uh, either on or, or off and the very heavy weighting the seventy two percent 
uh, first semester. Uh, I don't know that the proposed policy achieves that results, uh, result, um, particularly with students who are, um, for some reason or another, uh, underperformed uh, the first quarter or the first semester from their own perspectives. So whether it's some executive functioning challenges and ramping up, uh, whether it's some um, um, maybe reprioritization that that uh, that they needed to do and and take up the rest of the year to catch up, they really don't have that that opportunity um, under this this proposal versus some potential alternatives. Maggie. Um, thank you, um, Maggie Sharon. Thank you, Mrs. Javier. I appreciate your recognizing me. Um, I, I guess I, I want to speak in favor of the policy and I want to speak, um, first of all, because I know that it's taken our school administration and our guidance counselors um, a lot of time and thought and effort. And I do um, feel like, you know, not, not every, I, I checked in um, with six other school districts regarding local school districts regarding their policy but also you know in 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 30 surrounding districts relatively few of those districts actually brought this policy to their school committees at all for approval and just moved it forward so i want to offer thank you and respect to our school leadership for doing for doing us this um courtesy and giving us the opportunity to opine on it um but i, I have a few reasons that i support it um first of all I think that the fact that it is in alignment with and comparable to other districts with which we compare ourselves is important because while a district in another region or another type of school district might have a different thing, our students are being compared to other like school districts in Boston in terms of what they do after graduation. So I think staying in concert with them is important. Um, I think asking our teachers to provide letter grades for the kind of work they're assigning is an unreasonable burden that we're putting on them at this point because um, the work is not being designed with like the rubric for all of the letter grades and therefore to ask them to do it that way is, is really hard and unfair. And we don't know when kids work at home what kind of advantages they have. So we don't know when a kid turns in a project whose mom is able to help them and who has to do the project on their own. And I think asking for teachers to figure out something about that is, is not fair to the teacher and probably also not fair to other students. Um, and, and I think that it also speaks to different, yes, some students have the capability right now to really knock it out of the park. They have their own room, they have a great internet connection, they don't have other things that they're being expected to do at home. But that's not a fair reason to give a kid an A versus another kid who wishes they could get an A, but actually their parents are both working and they're in charge of their three or four younger siblings. And so it's not a fair time to give kids that opportunity to get ahead because not everyone can get ahead. And lastly, I think the matter of how we grade is truly a no-win situation for school committees, for school leaders, for all of us. There isn't gonna be any solution that anyone will put forward that everyone's gonna say, yay, you, you nailed the whole thing. Um, I, I think you guys did a reasonable, thoughtful, and reflective job, and I will support this proposal. This is Lynn, can I ask a clarifying question? Is, was, was the, is had any was what michael suggested michael were you suggesting that teachers assign letter grades uh, well i i haven't suggested an an alternative um i i i i have sent an alternative that was uh that that, that i would suggest uh that would entail and i can i can i can talk about that now uh but it would entail uh, essentially, the, the, the policy is based on uh, what I had sent out is based on the, what Denver, Colorado adopted um, after they did a, a, a credit, no credit for the remote learning time and the uh, community and students were quite dissatisfied, so they reversed course. And so essentially what they put forward is that there, um, there would be a letter grade uh, assigned for each student at the time that they, that learning went remote. 
And at that point in time, from that point in time to the end of the year, that student's grade could not go down um, unless the student was without, you know, good reason that Mr. Smith was, was talking about earlier, um, was, was completely disengaged. Uh, their grade would not go down from, from the in-class learning point, but they would have full opportunity during the remote learning time to improve upon their grade with a, an apportionment of grades being 25% per quarter. So it's, a, it's a, a, a no down, but yes, could improve. And then at the end of the year on a class by class basis, um, the students could select a credit, no credit with a, a COVID-19 you know, notation noted on, on the transcript. And, and they're the overarching um, uh, uh, guidance is give that every opportunity to, to do no harm and to allow uh, uh, flexibility to, to students. Maggie? Um, I, again, I feel like a policy such as that, first of all, we have seven weeks of school left. I 100% believe and, and, and trust that our school leadership is going to come up with a game plan for future times when we close that will involve sort of a more in-depth and sort of um, thinking ahead about all the possible contingencies if we go remote. But for this year, I think that we, saying do no harm, but then giving some opportunity for students who have all the advantages to get ahead isn't do no harm. It's harming people who don't have the opportunity to get ahead. And the people who do have the opportunity to use this time to get ahead are people who don't have other responsibilities, who aren't suffering from mental health trauma, who don't have, who have parents that are available to kind of help them out. And, and that's not fair. And we, to, to me, I'm just gonna stop here. I, I am happy if we move this to a vote. Uh, Kate and then Judy. Um, thanks. I just want to say that I, I share Maggie's concerns that um, while I, I recognize that this Denver plan is trying to be more flexible and allow kids a choice during this situation, and I understand that side of it, I think, though, unintentionally, what I fear is that kids, to Maggie's point, kids who have their own room, have a good laptop, have good access to Wi-Fi, don't have other responsibilities, and kids who are already self-starters might really take off with that opportunity. On the other hand, kids who are dealing with a whole host of things that we might not never know probably don't have the, the wherewithal to do that and don't have the in-school support that, they, that might be required for them to do well um, even in a normal learning situation, I understand they can virtually see their teachers and ask for help, but um, I just fear that this would further divide um, the people who are already doing well and the people who are already struggling. And this is, this is Lynn again. No, Lynn, Judy, Judy, no, Lynn, Judy was the next, and then you can okay. go. Okay, right. thanks. Judy, uh, Judy Miller. Um, I I also agree with what Maggie says. I just have one question. And you sort of alluded to this, John, at the beginning. How'd you come up with the 70% number? It just struck me as like, like I think maybe Jim Baruti sat down and like ran a million models and then you came up with this number. I just, I just wonder how you figured out that that was the right and I'm not questioning it. I'm just yeah. a point of information. No, Judy, it's an excellent question. And it, and it did, in fact, uh, the original model came through math. Absolutely. So you're spot on. Um, and it had to do with the number of weeks, um, calculating the number of weeks of in-school as opposed to virtual learning. That's where the 72, you could break it down into 36, 36. Um, and I, I know that for some people, when they saw the 72, they thought, whoa, that just seems high. You know, obviously semester one, semester two in a given year would be 50, but we feel like it's apples and oranges. We feel like while we were instructing in school with all the supports and, and 
to the best of our ability, the level playing field, we do feel like in this remote learning, it is not. And we're doing our very best on our end not to uh, have those things happen, but we, we just know that different family situations are different. And um, that's why we uh, came up with those percentages. Lynn? Um, so I, I think these last two rounds of discussion sort of put a finer point on my question to Mr. Smith, because I, I think this, this conversation around the Denver plan versus our plan, I think that to the extent that we're being asked to approve the plan, that's the kind of information I want to know as far as why we chose the plan we chose. I agree with Maggie that this is completely the, you know, within the realm of the administration. I, I don't know the first thing about, you know, how best to motivate students. And, and I, I frankly don't even understand what, Kate just said <laughs> about how how you know how one one plan can disadvantage certain kids and advantage other kids and so to the extent that I'm being asked to approve a grading policy I don't feel like I have the information to just even understand what why it is this is the best for our kids I trust that it's the best for our kids, but if I'm being asked to approve it, I'd like to understand why, why we decided this is the best for our kids. John, do you have thoughts about that? Or do yeah, you feel yeah. Like so when we discussed it? this with um, department chairs, you know, we felt as though, in fairness, there needed to be greater weight given to the first semester in the third quarter as opposed to the remote learning because we did feel like it was apples and oranges yet we also felt like there should be you know what's going to be the incentive for students to be engaged during this remote learning and that incentive was that 10 percent which they can maximize so we also had guidance take a look at this from a, a, a gpa standpoint you know and rob williamson who's sort of our our math guru on the guidance department said if students receive that 10%, they will receive a boost in their overall grade. Now, to Mr. Jaffe's point, he, he's right. If, if they struggled in the first semester, then yeah, well, that may have a limited impact on how much of a boost that's gonna be. That would be the case in a, in a regular scenario for a student, a full year English course, let's say. Say you had a, a, a slow start in that first semester, you know, Mr. Jaffe is absolutely right. Some students then can catch up. That's just an unknown. We don't know. We can't, we, we can't determine if that would have happened or would not have happened. So to the best of our ability, we're trying to use what did happen when we were in school and, and alter the weight of that a bit because that's cleaner or more efficient or tells a true story and then, but still give students an opportunity for some boost in that 10% at the end of the year so that we're not asking them to be A students, we're asking them to be engaged, we're asking them to complete assignments, we're asking them to do the best they can with this remote learning. And I think that's what our philosophy was. I, you know, Ms. Keegan and I want nothing more than opportunities where students can get a boost. I mean, that's why I changed the mid-year and the final percentage last year. I felt like mid-years and finals are important, but I felt like the weight of them was, was too much, frankly. And it was taking away from the work that kids were doing all throughout the quarter, and it, it was erasing some of that. So what we're looking at here is it's a little bit of an unknown. So, you know, how would they have done had we been in school fourth quarter? I don't know. I, I, I can't say for sure. Um, and so I can only go on what we know did take place and what we have a record of. And then how can we find a way to still provide some engagement for kids and a potential, you know, boost at the end for them 
albeit it, it for some kids it's going to be a little bit more than others depending upon how they did earlier and I, and I recognize that and, and we really couldn't find anything else and I, I know that people were adamant that because we were not grading there was no way that quarter four could be anything like a regular quarter. Dr. Keo. Thank you um, and um, and everyone actually the the uh, the conversation is an important one and obviously in a system like ours you know grades matter people pay attention and uh, having been through conversations in other school systems about weighting and it was a debate over whether we should unweight the GPA in order to level the playing field most of us who've been around in education for a while have seen systems who have that debate and it goes around and round and round and round it's so difficult to because there's always kind of a flip side right who gets impacted in a negative way who gets impacted in a positive way and i agree lynn that this is this is one of those things where you know school committees school committees may in fact not even be debating this we felt that it should come to the school committee because it is in fact a program of studies issue which you guys approve ultimately so um you know, if we were going to be doing it for the year, or we knew it was coming for next year, we'd want something speaking to it in the program of studies. We don't have that luxury. But I think what's really important to keep in mind during this process, are, there's a few things. Number one, the, the, colleges that, um, the colleges that will be accepting our students could look dramatically different in the future. There was a recent article out saying that many, many colleges will not be able to withstand the potential withdrawal of students. Families pulling their kids out because they're not willing to pay 60 to 70 or more thousand dollars a year for a remote learning online experience. The colleges are under tremendous pressure. And, and I think that people sometimes forget that they have to adapt to the situation. Every single school system could potentially have their own way of grading. And if they do, then there's a real possibility that a kid coming from Wayland compared to a kid coming from LS might have a completely different looking um, set of grades due to this uh, crisis. So they, just as they do when they look at GPAs, because every school weights them differently, they're just gonna have to give the kids a mulligan for this section. And I, I think when in listening to John's team when they were debating this, it was a really healthy debate. And I'm not saying that they have the perfect answer because I'm not sure there is one, but it was a healthy debate that his team, uh, I was just lucky enough to be in that particular meeting. They, they went back and forth and I appreciated the amount of time and energy that they put into it. And after all, they work most closely with our kids and I, I do trust them on this decision. And I, I get what you're saying, uh, Michael, that there's, there are other ways of looking at this. There's no question about it. But the other thing that I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of is this, and I'll try and keep it quick. What about the learning? It's not just about the grades. What about the learning? Okay, we have been having countless debates for the past three years within the administration about trying to focus on the learning as opposed to, you know, breaking up with the grades and falling in love with the learning. And I actually believe there's been some really meaningful learning taking place during this, uh, this, this disastrous situation. I think, you know, uh, the, the debate that we had last week the last, yes, last week, the joint meeting about, you know, how do we know it's having, what kind of impact it's having? It's a great question and probably won't know until after. But I'm confident that, in fact, what we've heard is that some kids are actually going to do very well in this situation. I see kids, you know, I've had people say, you know, kids are traumatized. And there are some, no question about it, because some home situations are, well, they're all different, right? Uh, everybody's home situation is different. But some kids are really, they're doing the kinds of things that we thought weren't that important growing up, like going down to the ball field to make pickup games or riding our bicycles in the woods and, and building forts and all that kind of stuff. We thought that wasn't important. And in retrospect, now we're trying to push back 
there's a big push to get kids doing more of that stuff. And we have a lot of kids doing that. So I'll be curious to see whether or not our kids suffer dramatically in terms of their uh, achievement throughout this thing. So I think it's right to support uh, John and Scott's following with the same um, structure, to support them in this, uh, this recommendation and to continue to keep our focus on, on keeping our learning uh, as meaningful as possible through this, this unfortunate situation that may in fact extend in some form into the fall. Thank you, Dr. Keo. Um, I would see, I think, feel like we've had a really rich discussion and debate. I'd like to see, um, just by a show of hands, if people are ready to move for a vote. It's just a straw poll. It's not a, whether you vote yes or no, whether you're ready to move to a vote. All right, I've got one, three, four. All right, um, so can I, if everyone could get off mute, all the school community people can get off mute. Do I hear a motion? to accept the high school's uh, grading policy so for the 1920 school year, end of the 1920 school year, yeah? Maggie, Maggie Sharon, so moved. Thank you, do I hear a second? Judy Miller, second. All those in favor? Discussion. Uh, okay, discussion. We've had discussion, but do you have another quick point, yeah? I, I think that's a formal part of the- No, it, the no you're right. It, it is, yes, you're right. Um, so so. I, I, I would like to um, pose the question and I'm not intending to be um, confrontational, so excuse me if it comes across that way, um, but I, I, would, I would ask um, leadership, what is the response from a parent who, who I believe rightfully, because I've heard it, um, who says, students have been promised over, over, and over again that they will not be harmed, and they are um, very uh, uh, typically year over year throughout their DS experience, uh, slow starters, and they've been able to compensate over second, third, and fourth quarter, or over third and fourth quarter, um, where now they can't because retroactively, the policy is being changed on those kids. Um, like, what do you say to them? I mean, honestly, I mean, this is school committee discussion. So honestly, what I would say to that and, uh, you know, my own I'm, child. I'm actually, I'm more interested in what the, because this is a question that gets asked to the administrators. It doesn't get asked to school committee members. So, all right, I, I defer, but I feel like who's the discussion is between us, I think, before we vote. Yeah, I, mean, I think. I think Maggie should be able to respond because I do agree that discussion and we'll see. I mean, I think, I think you respond. I, I don't think that people are being harmed. They're getting credit for all the work they did first and second trimester. They're getting credit first that semester quarter or whatever. They're getting credit for the work that they did third. They're moving into remote learning for that last quarter and they have the opportunity to earn a hundred. And for me, that's not harm. I mean, I am the absolute parent of a child who starts every year kind of phoning it in and says, oh, don't worry, I'm gonna catch up in third and fourth quarter. In my personal child's life, this is a moment of learning and it's the adage, why wait till tomorrow, what you could do today. So, it, I, I mean, I, I think that this is also one of those things that this is a national health pandemic and while I feel for any child who is incrementally not benefited as much as they might be had we not had the pandemic. I also have to say, like, there's a lot of people losing a lot of things. And this, for me, I feel like this is one of the more fairer ways we could handle this. But. Okay, yeah, Judy. Yeah, I, um, I, Michael, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I feel for those kids, um, but I guess my two points are, it's clear to me that the leadership at the high school um, did a really thorough job of figuring out what would be an equ equitable way to do this. And I am not an educator, I am a lawyer, and so I'm not that qualified to 
I am not nearly as qualified as Mr. Smith and Mr. Kellett and Dr. Keo. Um, and, and, and the second point, actually three points, the second point is any system that you put into place um, is going to be unfair to somebody, okay? And then the third point is, there are, is follows on what Maggie was saying, there's so much awful, there are, there's so many awfulness going on right now that grades to me, if, 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 if John and Scott and Andrew think this is good, let's just go with it because there are so many more gravely important things to focus on, you know? Thank you, Michael and Maggie and Judy. Um, I'd just like to really quickly say that I, that one of the things that really struck me that John said earlier was, uh, he's talking about the equity of access that existed in the earlier quarters that doesn't exist now. Um, and so I feel like there's equity, that that's where the equity is coming in. Um, and that's, I think, something that's really important to say, to, to be aware of. Um, but I do hear your points, Michael and, and Lynn. Um, I'm going to propose that we move to vote and we'll see where it lands. Um, understanding, like everyone has been saying, that there's, there's no perfect solution. The original grading that we had before wasn't perfect either. And now, as Maggie keeps saying, we're building the plane while we're flying. So, you know, this was, I think this was a really good solution given the circumstances personally, but um, I'm going to ask then if we can see, we'll go to a vote. We've got a motion. We've got a second. Um, all those in favor? Uh, Maggie, we'll do roll call. Maggie, Sharon, yes. Actually, it's not in favor, so we'll have a vote. Roll call. Maggie, sorry. Maggie, Sharon, yes. Thank you. Michael? Michael, JFB, no. Okay, thank you. Lynn Collins. Lynn? Lynn Collins, no. Kate? Kate Potter, yes. Judy? Judy Miller, yes. Okay, and Ann Hubby, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith, and to your team. And thank you for the really rich discussion, because I feel like that even moving forward, some of the things that we were talking about today will be taken in consideration and may help inform what happens in the future. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we're going to move over to Scott and the middle school grading plan, please. You gotta unmute yourself. Unmute. Or, <laughs> John. or get off of it. All right, well, while he's getting himself back on. Oh, there you are. Okay, I unmute. Am. there okay. you go. <laughs> Our, ours, ours follows suit with the high schools. Um, we, we, we had a lot of discussions about whether we should just go pass fail for third and fourth quarter and even if we should do final grades. However, you know, given the communities we live in, we, we recognize that the, um, some students might need those grades if they're, they're looking to go to private school or, or elsewhere. And also we wanted to give students uh, credit for what they've done already in, when they were in the brick and mortar in the, in the school. Um, and, the same same idea that that students there's not a level playing field on the remote learning we have a number of students that have you know that are faced with a number of challenges in in participating in remote learning um, we have our teachers are aware we will not count our our eighth grade students take a mid year in mathematics and that's not going to factor into uh, as percentage wise for their grades. However, I, I yeah, having dialogue with the three eighth grade teachers about looking at those scores and if it, it has a positive impact on a student's grade, we definitely want to see that reflected 
Um, but given that it's a mid-year exam and middle school student hasn't had a lot of experience with that type of assessment, I don't want to see it penalize the student in any way, shape, or form. Um, so we, we decided to adopt what the high school is doing uh, for consistency's sake. Does anybody have any okay. questions? Thank you. That's us. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Mr. Jaffe. Uh, Michael Jaffe, more of a, a, a comment. One of the, the uh, parents I spoke with is a parent of a middle school student um, who expressed to me that their child is putting in more work um, and more effort than they've ever done before. Um, and and regret around that not being um, the the effort, the engagement, the resiliency, and the grit not being recognized. Um, so I I would have the same concerns about the middle school policy, and uh, I think uh, the the balance of the school committee feels like we've spoken enough about the issue. So I'll say no more than that. <laughs> Okay, anybody else have questions or comments? Maggie? I mean, I, I feel generally speaking the way that I feel about the high school. I, I do, and, and I don't feel strongly enough about it to really say more than I'm not entirely sure that we need such a, I'm not sure that just because the high school's doing it is the right reason for the middle school. And I'm curious about whether or not we really need these final grades on the end of kids' transcripts. But on the other hand, I, I hear Mr. Jaffe's point about wanting to make sure to recognize kids' work um, in speaking with middle school families in particular. I think middle school families have very much, um, they are feeling for many of them that the a work is complex, that it's involved, it's taking a lot of work to get it done. Um, I think that's a double-edged sword in terms of, um, but, but I, I do hope that what um, children are getting back at the middle school is thoughtful um, feedback and that they are getting enough support to get this work done. Um, and, and I'm hoping that as we move forward that that's happening. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? All right, should we move to accept? Can I hear a motion to accept the updated grading policy for the middle school for the 1920 school year? So moved. Potter, so moved. So Kate moved. I, can I get a second, please? I'll second. Judy Miller, second. All right, discussion. All right, Maggie, we're going to vote. Maggie? Maggie, Sharon, yes. Michael? Michael Jaffe, no. Lynn? Lynn Collins, no. Kate? Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And Ann Hubby, yes. All right. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate that. And once again, thank you to your teams. Mm -hmm. I know that that was a lot of work, and, but that was really important work. Um, I think something to keep in mind, as has been mentioned several times, is that the likelihood of us having to go back to some sort of remote learning in the future there's certainly the possibility. So once again, everything that we learn here and discuss will help inform those future policies. So it's all important. All right, thank you. And now, Dawn. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, although I feel like we've met a lot, this is actually our first um, opportunity to share updated financials with you since your uh, March meeting. Um, yep. So your financials in your packet were as of April 30th. And I do have, um, obviously, with all the things that have been going on, some um, updated information to share. It's not just a boring um, same as last month. Um, so on the revenue side, a couple of things. One is, um, as we know, with the closure of school beginning for us is of March 13th, and not returning this um, spring season of high school uh, sports, obviously, uh, was canceled. With that, um, we are not assessing fees to any of the people who had initially signed up. So you will see sort of now a red number um, on your financial statements, which represents the, re the fees that we were expecting to, uh, be, to, to collect for the spring season, which is around 90,000. You're seeing a little bit more. We do have, I went ahead and wiped out the whole 
encumbrance, um, but we are still collecting a few fees um, from other seasons, so that number will go down a little bit. But basically, the negative revenue that you're seeing from not collecting fees, luckily, is being offset by the stipends that we're not paying to the spring coaches. So that's almost a dollar for dollar wash in your financials. Um, spring sports, as you know, actually is not a uh, an expensive um, sport for other um, supplies and such that need to be um, purchased. As you know, track is one of the largest um, sports in the spring, which doesn't really have any equipment. So the, the other savings is minimal, um, but we are going to take those savings and uh, appropriately purchase some items that are on our need our need list for equipment. So we're ready and um, set for next year as we hopefully head into uh, fiscal year 21. The other things on the revenue to point out is that uh, they do, as you know, twice a year, they look at what our school choice or uh, virtual school um, enrollment is. We must have one less student. So we picked up $5,000 um, in additional chapter 70 revenue. So you'll see that reflected in the statement. As well as if you follow the news back in, I think it was January, um, there were several fiscal year 19 supplemental budgets that Governor um, Baker passed. And one of those dealt with transportation. And so we did receive last month um, approximately 18,000 in additional fiscal year 17 chapter 71 revenues that they're having us include in our fiscal year 20 uh, statement. So you'll see the uptick in your chapter 71 uh, revenue to reflect that additional $18,000. Um, overall, the net impact really is just that 18 um, the 18 plus five because the we're going to uh, mitigate the um, reduction in the sports fees, knowing that that didn't, doesn't have a true revenue impact for us. Um, on operating expenses, obviously, um, with now the closure of school, we know we won't have any more substitute um, expenses. We will probably will not incur any more custodial overtime. So I have updated your positive sol positive salary variance to at least $200,000. And as you know, a big chunk of that was based um, upon things we've been reporting, actually probably since the beginning of the school year of post fiscal year 20 uh, budget uh, changes. So we have had some staffing changes and actually have had some staff lead during this year and obviously replaced with long-term subs, uh, which there is a savings for, for the district. Um, we still have some budget balance in the other categories that either um, will be encumbered or will be spent. Uh, so we'll give you a, a closer um, or a, a more updated variance um, at your June meeting. Now that we're sort of back and focusing on the business at hand versus triage, um, we're looking at things we have to just account for before the school year is over. So on expenditures, a couple of things. As we, um, as you know, we shared with you at the meeting last week, um, we are going to recognize the savings from transportation uh, with the negotiated amendment to our transportation contract. Um, we'll recognize approximately 116000 of uh, additional savings in transportation. This makes your transportation line item variants um, look fairly large because remember we are also carrying the use of the regional transportation fund from last year. Um, so that coupled with the savings um, looks like a pretty big number on your financials. Um, we've also increased um, a little bit the um, projection for savings in active health care um, uh, to about 150,000 and uh, I think the utility cost is hovering around 70,000. I'm expecting that we'll um, increase that a little bit. The building basically, all the, your buildings basically were empty for about six weeks, except for a, a daily uh, walkthrough through the custodians. Um, it's hard to anticipate what that savings is gonna be. So I'm waiting for those bills to come in, but I do anticipate obviously some savings because we had the building set at um, the minimum level of uh, heat. Uh, so we obviously there were savings. Um, in that realm, and obviously we're not using electricity as much, so it's just hard to know what that is because I've never had a month where there's no one in the building. So uh, I do anticipate a little bit more for that. The other um, uh, variances that are in your report have been there uh, for a while, so I just include them for your 
um, for your full picture. Um, and I always continue to remind you that um, the region's fully funding your fiscal year 21 capital. So although you see a large number at the bottom, know that 575,000 um, is funding your capital, plus we're using 175 uh, from E and D, which is part of this number to fund your fiscal year 21 budget. So I think those are important things to keep in mind uh, when you look at the bottom line for right now. Um, in addition, so um, you have to keep, so um, regional transportation reimbursement, if you remember, is um, it's sort of a, a one-year lag, just like circuit breaker, if you're used to circuit breaker. So because we're not going to have as much transportation revenue reported on our end of the year report this year, we're going to see a reduction next year in our Chapter 71. So all regional school districts have been advised to take the savings from this year and put it in your regional transportation fund. So you have that shortfall um, that we're gonna experience next year accounted for. And then remember on top of that, we also have the large increase in your transportation to begin with, which we did sort of budget for, but this gives us another safety net for that. Because I will say, I think, although we've gotten to the point where we are almost getting 80% of regional transportation uh, reimbursed, I'm not so sure that's what we're gonna see <laughs> going forward. Um, and so it's, this gives us a little extra safety net, not knowing what that reimbursement rate's gonna be um, for next year. So I will bring forward that to you probably at your June meeting, um, as we've done in prior years, to um, transfer some of the current revenue into your um, regional transportation funds. Um, and as you know, so with the sudden closing um, in March, um, that's when we go through and we sort of look at what items we've budgeted that uh, we still need to purchase. Um, and so we're a little behind on that, um, but I've reached out to most of the building principals to set up time to go through the budget, see what we had budgeted for, and make sure we execute those purchases. You don't see all those encumbrances yet because we need to get them into the system. So just know there's still numbers in the variances that we have allocated to purchase something. We just need to um, move forward with doing that in the next couple of weeks. So by June, hopefully we should have all that um, accounted for and you can really see, sorry, what your bottom line looks like. Um, any questions on the financial statement? I have, one, I have one quick one. Do you see, do you foresee any issues with completing purchases by the June 30th deadline for this year? No, um, if we know different? that it's been, if it's on its way, um, we, we can, as long as it's been purchased and we know it's on its way, we'll be okay. Um, they're not too tight that it has to necessarily be here. Um, by June 30th, we have been testing the waters a little bit to see how quickly things are starting to come. We are seeing slower, um, which is yeah. why I'm, I'm putting a push on getting all the orders in in the next two weeks, um, just to sort of protect us from things not being available and we need to change course or um, mm -hmm. making sure that we're not passing too past that, too much past that June 30th um, deadline. So uh, with the admin assist back in the buildings this week, we each building has um, the ability now to put their purchase orders in and we'll, we'll, we'll ramp everything back up again. Okay, that, that's great. And before I get, just really quickly, Michael, one other quick thing. Um, I'd like to say thank you, Don. I said this in the, our meeting on Thursday, I believe, but that, because we are doing the because you have thought to do capital through our fund our, us fund the capital sorry um we are able to continue with that and move forward um whereas if we had not projects would have been been on hold and we probably we would have missed doing any of our summer projects because right, as yeah. we know sherburn has already um postponed their town meeting so without mm -hmm. that, those approvals you wouldn't have had access to your funds so it's just the, the financial circumstances that we were in and the planning that we did if we were lucky um, because if you drive by campus you'll notice that the high school parking lot was just recently paved and it looks really nice looks um, great doesn't yeah. it look great yeah, yeah so we're taking advantage of this opening in time and i will have to give uh chris Hendricks and his um staff uh two thumbs up the fields look amazing um, mm -hmm. But again, as I've mentioned to you, because 
the fields aren't being used and he doesn't have to work around April vacation. He's been able to do things when they should be done in the fields and um, they just look fabulous. So again, I always try to look for the silver linings and those, those are a couple that we're seeing here on campus. Yeah, and can you just do a quick explanation about what happens with town meeting being moved with the regional budget? Yeah, yeah, I was going to do that next. Just want to make oh, sure no one had any sorry. questions. On the, that's okay. <laughs> on the financials, because before I changed. Uh, okay, changed I'll let people here. have their questions. Um, Michael, you had a question. Yeah, my, my question um, is is about capital and and next year. So I can ask it now, or I can wait until after you talk about next year, the one twelve, um, whichever you want. Right. No, you can go ahead and ask about capital. Okay. It's a, and, and really with respect to the, well, what I noticed is the paving. My, my, my guess is that you were able to do that early and that was originally planned for summer, but that is something you're able to move forward. Is that correct? We were able to do that because if you remember in March, you approved your capital projects, the yeah. 575000 So we're already funding that money. But that's something that you would have, if not for the closures, you would have waited until summer. And um, we we early. actually were we were actually slated to do it April break, the Got paving, um, and so we were able to move it up. But uh, other things we will be able to, as you know, you have some floor work in the building, so mm -hmm. we're getting the, the guys, um, the staff started back this week, um, full floor. So we're assessing how we can incorporate that and we've been contacting our vendors because obviously now the calendar usually that we only have in July and August is now expanded to um, you know mid-May and June so we're trying to make sure we get ourselves scheduled for that but make sure it falls nicely in with our our summer cleaning um, so we're, we're mapping that whole schedule out to make sure that we um, take advantage of this um, but, but you know about extra seven weeks here now that we have everyone back. Thank you. Any questions on the financials and then I'll just sort of tell you about fiscal year 21. Anybody? No? All right. So um, because um, regardless of what happened to our town meetings, all regional districts had already been, as I told you in your uh, memo, had been uh, um, instructed to complete the necessary paperwork to request a 112th budget. So as you know, we can't, we, we survive on the assessments and if our towns haven't approved those assessments, we really don't have any way to pay our bills. So the way that the, um, the Department of Revenue, the Office of Gov Regional Governance and DESE work with that is that they assess the towns um, 112th of your budget as it was set in fiscal year 20. So the schools are usually fine with that because if you know, our teachers don't come back until September. So our biggest payroll expense doesn't start yet. So we're really at no um, uh, uh, harm by having the 112th of last year's budget um, be our, our assessment to the towns for potentially July, August, and hopefully by September hopefully we'll have some town budgets. As you know, um, Sherburn has already postponed theirs to late summer, early fall. I did speak with Dover today and um, they're still holding out hope that they can get something done in June, but they're waiting and standing by. Um, but we have, we have this safety net to go to so that everyone can continue at, the, at all the regionals to move forward. It's just not with necessarily the budget that you thought. Now, the process is such that, say, we had a debt payment due, they would take that into account. So there is some flexibility with this, and their goal is just to make sure that no one's harmed by this. Um, but it will be a huge undertaking uh, for the state to go and check all these numbers out and approve a 112 budget for all the regions. Um, and then they'll be doing uh, the same thing on the municipality side with a different organization. Um, but we've had already probably a, about an hour and a half conference call on this and a couple other ones um, set up uh, in mid-May to make sure we all know how we're doing this, but just know that that will uh, be undertaken by this office. And um, once we have those assessed numbers, we'll share, you, we'll share them with you and then we send them out to the towns because that will be um, what sets their July and most likely August payment uh, for you. And then we'll play catch up um, once the budgets are approved. So something new to learn. 
Awesome. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Michael? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Michael Jaffe. Thanks, Don. Uh, do, do you, I know nobody has a, a, a crystal ball um, about next year, um, but kind of knowing what you know now and knowing what may be possible next year, um, do you have concerns around the budget that we've passed and, and do you anticipate any particular kind of categories where there's going to be a big um, aha moment you know, we're, we're going to need to do some creative work uh, in order to, to meet what may happen. That right. may be an unfair question because... No, no, I mean, we, we've, already, we've already been talking about that. So um, as, we, as I just mentioned, there is a, there's a little blip with Chapter 71, right, that I talked about. One, we're going to get um, an unequal um, reimbursement because with a shortfall this year and the larger increase next year, uh, but we're going to plan for that by putting um, saving or putting money into the regional transportation funds so we can make ourselves whole for fiscal year 21. There is a possibility that you built your budget on governor's um, chapter 70 cherry sheets. Um, I think most of us believe that that's, that's not going to be where we land. We're going to land below that. But remember, we don't feel that they'll go hopefully below what we're getting right now for fiscal year 20. So the region will have to try to potentially make up that increase that we saw between um, our, what we're seeing in 20 and what the governor had initially put forward in his budget. Um, you know, it seems like not that long ago, but in the third week of January. But that's some of the financial planning that um, we're gonna try to do with some of the savings I think that we have now to be, be on top of that. So some one-time purchases that and that's what I'll be working on to bring to you in June. I think there's some one-time purchases that we have in the fiscal year 21 budget that if our things that I think we can um, have access to, we'll go ahead and bring them in in fiscal year 20. Um, and I'm not talking huge amounts, but just some way, because if you do see a decrease in chapter 70, that's a direct responsibility of the region. Because remember mm -hmm. that netted out before we right. do the assessments. And so any way that mm -hmm. I can prepare ourselves if we do see that decrease, um, so we don't have a negative impact in 21, that's what we're spending some time um, to do as I, as I sit down with each of the building uh, principals um, to see what we can bring forward to sort of give us a little safety net. And then if we don't spend it in 21, it would just fall to, the, to your bottom line. And, and I, I guess you don't, you don't see the, the need or, or maybe even the procedural possibility of saying, you know what, let's, let's, let's rework the, the budgets for next year a bit. So we at, have this some point, we, at, at this point, we haven't been giving any indication, I think, from either of the towns that we need to go back and look at our budget closer. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a detailed call today with Dover and uh, they, they feel like they're fine. There's no need to ask any of their departments to alter their budgets at this point in time. Um, I think where some of this is going to fall out is probably when we start building fiscal year 22, because then I think mm -hmm. reality will have set in. And that's when I think we're going to see um, a little bit more, you know, maybe it's not going to be level service. Maybe it's going to be something that's your, you know, a little bit less than what your fiscal year 21 budget was because of some of the um, changes that could impact. Remember, the towns, our towns are about um, heavily dependent on property taxes, which luckily for our towns, they're not dependent on the state giving them any money. Um, and so mm -hmm. as much as we can protect uh, the property taxes, that's where I think we'll be okay. So that's where we don't know how that's all going to play out. This is a different kind of situation, right? It's a forced shutdown of the economy. What's going to happen? So those are some of the things we're looking at. But um, I think we're going to try to hold course for 21. But during 21, I think we're going to be thinking about how we can do things differently so that if we do need to make some cuts, we strategically know where we can make those cuts without um, jeopardizing the education of the students. Just one, one uh, final comment. Um, I, I mean, thank you for the great work um, that you've been doing throughout the process and, and particularly around being creative for um, uh, being able to come up with solutions to not to have to go back to the town so much. Um, I, I think, um, this year's town meetings, 
I don't know how they're going to take place, but however they take place, perhaps there's opportunity to highlight some of that. Um, you've spoken with us about it, and 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 we've spoken, I think, with with some some town folks about you know funding uh, our own capital. Uh, but there 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 are some terrific things that that are being done that maybe that will um, give us some some good capital, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. um, Come you know fiscal year 22, when uh, there'll be some credibility that hey they've really done all they could do creatively uh, to make things work for a very difficult time. Yeah, and hopefully we'll have that opportunity. What one thing we still haven't had is the budget hearing um, either, right? So that's our opportunity where we actually do present our budgets to both towns, um, not in detail in Chevron, but definitely in Dover. There's a full presentation. I don't know exactly how I think they're still trying to maybe do those virtually I'm not sure but that's an opportunity for us to share uh, some of the things we've been doing but as I can see we've got most of our um, finance uh, and warrant and advisory people on the call with us so hopefully they can share some of the things that we've talked about tonight um, with their groups too but know that um, Andrew and I are in a constant contact like I said I just had a call today with the town of Dover and we'll probably have a touch uh, point at some point with the town of Sherburn um, also just to make sure we're on the, the right track. But, you know, just so you know, the two elementary schools probably are not in the position that you guys are and we're probably looking at not being able to do their capital projects um, this summer. So um, that's again, luckily the numbers fell in our favor and we were able to absorb it at the region and which gave us a lot more flexibility with our timing. Jay Matarazzo from Sherburn Advisory. And um, if I may, I just, we, we have not had a specific conversation uh, right now on Sherburn Advisory about um, a second look at the budget, if you will, or anything like that um, with respect to the school committee. Obviously, it looks like there's, we have suspected that there would be some very, some very substantial positive variances, and it looks like that will, in fact, be the case. Um, but we have had many conversations about the fact that. Um, there are a lot of unknowns, obviously, and, and Don, you alluded to some of this, you know, and uh, one obviously being that we don't know what our COVID related expenses may be at this point, or, you know, what they may amount to as, you know, collectively as towns, we don't know uh, what the effect on property values will be. Uh, I think we can be pretty sure that the economic effect of, you know, the downturn that we're all seeing is going to have an impact on families. So um, while we certainly appreciate, Michael, that the school committee has been very creative about um, finding ways to not have to come back to the towns, there is a flip side to that, which is that um, that has meant in certain circumstances that um, you know, END has been reduced or you know, what otherwise might have been um, an excess that would have been returned to the towns has not been returned. Um, and so you know, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. You know, there's good and bad that comes with, with with looking at both sides of that coin, but um, I do think that it is likely that you know when we take a, you know when June comes around and we have a better sense of what the real numbers are, that um, it's likely. And I can't speak for Sherman Advisory as a group right now, but I think it is likely that um, we will be hoping that some of those um, creative ways of uh, not having to go back to the towns might might be. Um, skipped this year so that perhaps some more money could go back if there is that excess over you know the five percent at END that there other that there likely will be is what we're guessing. So just something to think about for the future. I realize you know none of those numbers are are hard and fast at this point, but it, you know there are there are two sides to the coin and and I just ask you to you know consider that. Yeah, and absolutely, Jane. Um, you know, and I, I've only looked at the first pass at the number, but I've already shared with Andrew that there is probably a potential that there will be a give back um, in some form to both towns this year because of we're already pretty much at our cap of E and D, and um, even taking into account that we're paying for our own capital and uh, protecting ourselves for transportation next year, uh, we have had some favorable variances that don't even coincide with. Um, the, the pandemic that we're in right now. It's just the nature of where we were with the salaries, as I said, that there, there could be, um, uh, that we would, we would cap out at our, one point, at our 5% and have some uh, turn back for the two towns uh, come the end of this fiscal year. 
Um, so thank you, Don, for all of that. I really appreciate that. And I'd like to just sort of um, add that I feel like when the district has been looking at things and taking money from one year and putting it towards expenses that we knew we're having the next year, that it's you're, you're taking a very long-term view, Don. And so it's expenses that would be given to the town, turned into the town. Yeah. We're asking the town for the money at some point. Right. Um, we're just doing it earlier. And in fact, in some cases, I know that because we've been able to do things sooner, we've actually saved money like the paving. Um, right. So that there have been some positives to us. Yeah. It, I mean, self-funding. Right. I mean, I think in a way, if we, um, it's no different than if we would have assessed for that capital, right? It, we, it, the money would have, still have to come from the town. So we're just uh, um, assessing and taking the assessments early versus having that to go through the process. So I, I don't feel that anything that we're doing is um, not saving the town's money. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd love to be able to move on to the OPEB. Um, Dawn, are you talking about that or was that you, Maggie? Um, I can introduce it and then I'm going to turn it over to the subcommittee. So, you know, we're, this is a continuous process, but we were saying last week when we were having these meetings, it's actually sort of a nice, healthy way to progress through um, a new topic for us is that we've been able to bite it off in pieces and really understand each piece versus trying to cram it through. So our goal um, for your meeting tonight was to bring forward um, the committee, as you know, has to approve an investment policy and with our um, agreement to move forward with PARS, um, they sort of have a built-in investment policy because they um, contract with Vanguard. So we were able to dual purpose here and take our, um, the agreement that we have to sign with Vanguard and, it's, and it serves as a dual purpose as the investment policy uh, for the committee because um, if you can see on Schedule B, it sort of, line, it sort of lays out the options that we have. So that in, in fact sets our investment policy uh, for the um, region moving forward. So I'll pass it off to uh, Maggie and Judy to just sort of give you a brief summary of uh, some of the calls we had and make you feel comfortable with, with how we're moving forward. Thank, thank you, Don. Um, so first of all, just on behalf of um, Judy and I, who are your employment, it's is Maggie Sharon, sorry for, um, for the minutes. Um, on behalf of Judy and I, who are your Employment Benefits Subcommittee members, um, I want to say a huge thank you to, to Don Fattori, a huge thank you to um, all the personnel at PARS um, who have been wonderful and very responsive and um, very thorough in terms of um, this new relationship we have working with them as we create an investment fund for our um, OPEB trust. Um, I, I want to also thank um, our actuary, whose name, remind me, Don? Parker, Elmore. Parker. Thank you. Yeah, Elmore. Parker. Parker, um, who is also during the time um, since we um, were able to agree to move forward with PARS, has been able to take a look at um, our um, agreements, our strategy, and, and was able to give us some professional opinions on, um, you know, different choices that we've had, um, one versus another. We've had a number of calls um, with the folks at PARS. Um, we also were able to speak with um, the specific representative from Vanguard, um, and they were able to talk us through different strategies, obviously strategies with respect to the um, state of the market these days and kind of where things are at. Um, you know, in terms of our funding policy is in fact that um, quite long, um, and I appreciate probably the two lawyers among us have had the chance to look at it. It's a, it's a boilerplate policy, and, and so we're really hoping that we can move forward with this, because this is the policy that they generally use with all of their school districts. Um, and in terms of our choice of PARS, uh, we have, by choosing PARS, moved forward with the Vanguard um, products. Um, and so you can see from that Schedule B, which is on page 35 of your packet, um, that really it's a choice um, in a range that be begins at fixed income and ends with a growth strategy. Um, we, has, as a subcommittee, are going to recommend that we move forward by making our investment in the growth funds. 
on behalf of the school committee. Um, understanding that the um, future employment benefit subcommittees will always have control over making that change. Um, and so that's something that our work will be to continue to review and observe and see where um, these funds are headed if some, for some reason we want to do something else. Um, in speaking with Parker and in speaking with the strat strategy guys um, that we had um, the calls with at Vanguard, really because the time horizon of this investment is, is, is longer than 30 years. Um, that's what really brings us to the idea that the growth strategy is the way to go. Um, and Judy, I wanna just invite you to, to share, is there anything we should add in um, or other, are there things we wanna share with the committee? Yeah, all I wanted, just one thing, which is um, we talked to them about, you know, the uncertainty of, of um, investing in this environment. And they and they assured us and that they have looked at the issue and that the growth front fund is still um, the most appropriate for you know the kind of investment that we're making. Yeah. Um, so those calls were really important to us in terms of getting our questions answered. They came highly prepared with you know all different kinds of slides and things. Um, we left those meetings feeling pretty confident about their ability to shepherd the process through. And also about, you know, they're clearly set up to do this work on behalf of municipalities. And so that felt really good. Um, we will, what we're talking about in terms of the um, investment policy will um, specifically apply to the monies that we set aside in the prior year that we'll invest on June 3rd um, with, um, with PARS. And then when we return to you in June, um, we'll be asking you to look at the funding policy, which will be our last um, piece. And that really speaks to like, what's our strategy? Because one of the things in setting up an OPEB fund is you have to, your, your organization has to have a strategy whereby you commit to putting something in that fund every year. And so we'll be coming forward with a proposal for what we feel would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, given that, you know, especially looking forward, we, we know that times um, are going to become more austere. And in doing that, we need to be prudent. Um, and also a big, um, one of the things we talked to Parker about was like, how is it that this work will impact our discount rate going forward? Um, and the, um, obviously the creation of the fund, the, um, you know, changing the cost share for the employees' um, health care, and then choosing the growth fund, and then also what our um, funding policy is are all the pieces that will ultimately impact that discount rate. So we're happy to take your questions, and either Judy or I, or probably more likely Don, will, will have answers for them. <laughs> so just to clarify, this is like a one-time, because this is when we're first setting this up, it's a one-time adoption of the investment um, policy. Um, with the caveat that the subcommittee then on um, a, whatever time frame they decide can change what fund, but it will always be one of those four funds that's listed and therefore that's why it's your investment policy that we're asking you to accept. Any questions? Michael had a question. Oh, sorry, Michael. Uh, what What is the, the frequency that's anticipated for the um, the subcommittee to reevaluate, not, not necessarily change anything, uh, but to to take a look and, and reevaluate for potentially changing or keeping is that an annual? Oh yeah, probably not even probably even a little bit more than an annual. Uh, PARS mm -hmm. will give us quarterly reports. Um, that's part of their just normal operation. So my guess is that that subcommittee would meet in some form, probably on a quarterly basis, just to check in. Not very long meeting, but just as sort of, you know, actually now we know we can do Zoom, it would just be easy just to do a Zoom meeting just to check in once we get those quarterly reports. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd meet with our rep from PARS and just probably do a quick check to see where we stand. I don't see us flipping back and forth a lot because one of the goals is to stay right, stay where you are um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and hold there. But I think it's uh, prudent upon us to probably have at least a quarterly meeting of that group um, just to discuss things. Thank you. And one of the other things that we can have if the committee has an interest in that is the representatives from PARS um, are very happy to come out and share more information with you, even if you want that annually. Um, that's definitely something that's in their wheelhouse um, and something that we can decide, especially if the community um, has a lot of curiosity about how that fund's being managed. Um, second, I, I, 
I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm torn. I, I, I think it's, it's really um, important to have, to have this funded and to have the funds set aside. Um, I'm quite concerned about the timing in the market. Um, this is, is, is my, my unofficial part-time job is, is investing and reallocating. Um, and I, I, I think it's the right call on the growth strategy as well, particularly with the, the window. Um, but I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm so concerned that, you know, the money goes in on the third and then three days later, we, we have a, a, a cumulative 40% drop because we are in such a volatile, and we just saw that. And there's, there's no, I understand there's no way to crystal wall, but we're just in such a state of volatility. Um, and, and I guess my wish is that we started out on a high point rather than on a, a 20 or 30 or 40 percent down point, which ultimately that would get made up, but you're just making up from a low point. I mean, I, I think to your point, I believe we do have to put the money into the investment by the end of the fiscal year. Is that correct, Don? We what we could put it into a money market. It can go into a holding account. So as we get closer to June, we, if there seems to still be some major volatility, we can reach back out. We we don't have to put it into the and in the, the funds right away. We just have to get it deposited so it's sitting in um, U.S. Bank with with parse. Um, so that's what we're, and that's why we were so uh, careful in the timeline because you have to wait 90 days. There's 90 day holding period, before, you know, once you guys adopted that. So um, we can touch base. They didn't have any concern because um, we, you know, Judy and I and, and Maggie asked those exact same questions. Um, when you're looking at something over 30 years, a week or two here, and he said it's really not going to make a difference. Uh, um, yeah, can I just, Judy, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you know, if you if you look at the what happened to the market from like 1929 to 1959, that's that's the time frame. We're not human. The school district isn't a human being. It's an it's an entity. And so, you know, this is a fund that's going to be there for a long, long time. And so, whether we put it in on June 3rd or June 30th, you know, and there's a you know, some kind of a crash, you know, after we put it in, it's a, it's a long-term investment, obviously. And, so, and I, I fully appreciate that. And, and I, I think long-term, even if you invested the money on the third in growth, you'd do fine. But the, the difference is if you use the 40% dip, you're starting 40% down, and, and then regaining that rather than starting, you know, higher and then growing higher. And, and so I guess the only thing I would, I would ask, and I'm in, in, in support of, of the investment uh, policy, I'm also in support of you guys determining, you know, when and where that's going to be. But I would request that you, you do kind of take a look at the, at the volatility index um, and maybe decide, you know, we're going to wait a month. Um, we're going to put it in money market, and then we'll we'll just transfer it over to the you know to the blended equities and fixed income. Yeah, and the Vanguard representative that we spoke with. I mean, if they had any concerns, they would advise us um, to do something different. But at this juncture, when we spoke with them last week, obviously, right? It, we were talking as though every how we are now, and they didn't see any issues. But we can definitely take that into consideration and. and before we move forward on June 3rd, have another check-in with them to see if they uh, continue to have the same recommendation for us. Okay, th thank you. Um, so now, Don, do you, we just need to vote for the plan? Oh, the invest, so the investment policy. Investment so the policy. document that is in your um, packet is referring to in ours investment policy. So the regional subcommittee is uh, accepting the, uh, approving the investment policy for the OPEB uh, trust fund. So do I hear a motion to approve the investment policy for the OPEB trust fund? Lynn Collins, so moved. Thank you, Lynn. Do I hear a second? Maggie Sharon, second. Thank you, Maggie. We'll vote Maggie. Maggie Sharon, yes. Michael. Michael Jaffe, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, I'm sorry. Lynn. 
Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And, and I say, Anne Hovey also, yes. Thank you so much. I know that you guys have had tons of meetings and have researched this really thoroughly. So thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm we look forward to the last piece in June um, with the funding policy, which we, we have some ideas of what we're doing. We just need to put it down in um, a nice paragraph for you. And that'll, that'll be the final uh, um, check mark for this to-do list. So thank you. And, and I just wanted to also say thank you, Anne, and thank you so much to the whole committee. Thank you to um, Claire Graham, if she's out there, because she was a big proponent of us getting this work done. And um, I feel very hopeful that with this step, we have done um, another step in terms of ensuring that our commitment to our retirees um, is something that will stand the test of time. Um, because I do think, especially in the middle of a health crisis, that um, making sure that um, employee benefits and retiree health benefits especially are something that we can guarantee to all of our, um, all of our retired faculty and all of the good folks sitting here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. That was well said. All right, we're moving on. Um, we've got to request that we have to vote on the request for co-ops for the varsity and JV boys um, ice hockey team. Um, did anybody have any questions or thoughts? Or we're good to move? All right. Um, I, think I'm, I think we need to do them separately because one is a renewal and then one is a new formation. That's all right. All right. So do I hear a motion to approve the renewal of the Cooperative Boys Varsity Ice Hockey Team with Weston High School for the 2021 and 21-22 seasons? So moved. Maggie Sharon. Do I hear a second? Second. Collins. Thanks, Lynn. All right. Um, discussion? No? All right. We'll vote. Maggie. Maggie Sharon, yes. Michael. Michael Jaffe, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And Anne Hovey, yes. Do I hear a motion to approve the formation of a cooperative boys JV ice hockey team with Weston High School for the 2021 and 21 22 seasons? So moved. Judy Miller. Thanks, Judy. A second? Second, Michael Jaffe. Thanks. All right. Discussion? No. Vote. Maggie. Maggie Sharon, yes. Michael. Michael Jaffe, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And Anne Hovey, yes. Thank you. Um, we also have girls ice hockey. Do I hear a motion to approve the Cooperative Girls Ice Hockey Team with Hopkinton High School and maybe other schools uh, for the 2021 season? Well, Maggie so Sharon, moved. so moved. Can we just, oh, yeah. Andrew? Yes, Andrew? I, I don't think you're voting to approve the team itself because it's already in existence. I think you already voted to approve that. You're just approving the reformation so that Hopkinton is going to be the lead host uh, team. And we're going to... Oh, okay. I thought we had to just approve them every year. I thought that was like, that's why we're doing the... I, go ahead. Oh, so John? Yeah, yeah. clarification. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hubby. Um, because of the number of participants that Hopkinton has had over the last few years and our numbers have dropped, we mm -hmm. clearly still want to make sure that we're providing an, uh, an extracurricular opportunity for Dover Sherborne uh, women to play ice hockey. Um, but Hopkinton is going to be taking over as like the lead school, similar to our gymnastics program through uh, MADS. Medfield is the lead school, but we are a continuing partner. We had been in charge, so it had been Dover Sherborne slash Hopkinton hockey. Now it's going to be Hopkinton, Dover Sherborne, and maybe like and others. others. <laughs> yeah. um, it just, it does make sense to shift it. Um, the great news is our women will still have an opportunity. Any woman at Dover Sherborne will still have an opportunity to play ice hockey, um, but they will take over the leadership of the program. But John, do they, uh, didn't we, didn't the school committee approve this um, yes. cooperative team last year? That's correct, yes. And that's a two year um, approval. So next year we would be back if it continues. This is really uh, okay. about information. Okay. Got it. All right. My mistake. Thank you. All right. So let me reword the motion. 
Do I hear a motion to approve the reformation of the Cooperative Girls Varsity Ice Hockey Team with Hopkinton High School as the lead, uh, lead school um, for the 2021 season? Maggie Sharon, so moved. Second. Lynn Kate Potter. Potter. <laughs> uh, I'm going to let Kate do it. Kate Potter. Bye. Yay. She seconded it. Uh, all right. We'll do the vote. Maggie. Hey, Sharon, yes. Michael. Michael Jaffe, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And Anne Hovey, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, wait, we're not done. Not um, done. No. So we've got the proposed changes to the 2021 student handbook. This is a first read. Um, John and Scott, did you, do you have things you want to highlight? I know you showed in the packet. It was actually very thorough. Thank you. And I really appreciated the bolding and highlighting. It made it so much easier. So thank you. Yes. Um, I appreciate just, just Hubby, I just have a couple that I'll yep. go through, but uh, I want to give yep. kudos to uh, Ann Keegan for that highlighting and, and bold. She deserves full credit for that. Um, all right, let me just pull those up. So a couple of them are just related. Can everyone still hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, are just related to clarifying because of our new start times. So the proposed change, Typically, we say we want parents to or guardians to contact us before eight o'clock. Now we're just saying before nine o'clock, uh, just in the case of letting us know their their son or daughter is going to be out because of um, illness or or whatever reason. The second one that is bold just talks about uh, students need to arrive by nine forty five. And we just wanted to give some clarification around this. Um, we had some misunderstandings this year and, and fair enough, it wasn't spelled out clearly that in order to be a participant in a sport or to attend an event. So let's say if you came in at one o'clock at the afternoon and you then wanted to go to the boys basketball game at night, you would have needed to have prior permission and as long as we got a phone call from a uh, parent or a guardian, we almost always approve it. It's just communication. We just want to make sure that mom or dad knew that um, their son or daughter was out of school. So uh, it's just clarifying that in order for you to not only be a participant in a sport, but also to be a spectator uh, to sport. The other is... Um, just some clarification around uh, detention, just you know, saying that we'll give you 24 hours notice, uh, proper arrangements. You can also serve it on that day. It's just reiterating that the expectation is you take care of this. I will say Ms. Cruz and Ms. Keegan are very flexible. Kids come down on a regular basis. They'll say something in my work schedule changed or I have a family piece and I change it to Thursday instead of Wednesday. And unless it's a continuous pattern of students doing this, we always have said yes, because um, the, the, the priority is that they do take care of this, but it doesn't always have to be that day or the next day. Um, another piece that is just kind of a change just because of our later start time, we are gonna have uh, office detentions are gonna begin shortly after the flex block begins and then continue in a little bit after school. And the purpose of doing that was to also enable students to be able to uh, still participate in their extracurriculars by leaving uh, the bus or whatever the case may be, or also to get the extra help. It still will be in place that if a student needed to get extra help in English and they had an office detention for tardies, they could go to that English teacher get the extra help and simply just get a pass saying they were with the English teacher and we would credit them with that. The only time we don't for office detentions is if it were uh, something that involves skipping school or some sort of really negative behavior. If it's just tardiness, we're a lot more uh, flexible. Office detention was just specified a little bit as to you know what we do expect for that. Um, so there were some changes there. We did have um, some changes around um, students moving out of the district. We just wanted to make sure it's aligned with what your policy is in central office. 
we did add a communication guideline. Just we sort of clarified it, and we really do think at the high school level that you know they're advocating for themselves is important. We understand that can't always be how it happens, but we do want that to be the first step. We want there to be uh, the student reaching out to the teacher, and then subsequently. Um, just to follow that procedure and that protocol. So instead of the parent directly calling uh, the assistant headmaster, that they do go through the teacher to get that information. Um, and whenever possible, we do want the student to be present at the meeting. A lot of times that can clear up any misconceptions, it can help sort of if there needs to be a repairing of the relationship with the teacher and the student, uh, that can be really positive. This is simply meant as some clarification for protocol. Um, but there's always exceptions. And for example, if it's something pertaining to uh, a teacher uh, concerning behavior of a teacher, obviously the parent's going to contact administration. I mean, that just goes without saying. This would just be more on the lines of student is struggling in a class, we want them to go to the teacher and then subsequently their parent can get involved or the, the student can go to the department chair. And what we have found in a lot of these cases, not everyone, but a lot of them is plans develop and reports develop and understandings and clarification happens. But there's always gonna be that opportunity if a parent wants to continue to take it up um, different stages. We just wanted to outline it and be a little more specific. That's it. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Smith. That was actually really helpful. Um, I really appreciated the clarification around flex block. I think that I know that there's a lot going on next year with the change in start time. So, uh, does people have any questions? We will have time also to for brief discussion. The next we won't vote this meeting. We're going to vote next meeting. Um, but any, Mr. Jaffe. So I I sent through a a slight um, suggested modification. I don't even know if it's something that that warrants discussion or maybe it can just get sent on and and considered since this is a first read. All right, yes, let's do that. <laughs> okay, and, and then one I other thing I just yep. noticed, with, maybe that can go together with that email is maybe capitalize on the communications guidelines uh, capitalize the involvement just to make it consistent. Yep. Sorry, I'm just on that page. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I will pass on uh, Mr. Jaffe's suggestion on to you, Ms. Dr. Keo, and then you can pass that on. Okay. Just, thanks. Uh, yes, Maggie. I, I just want to say thank. I read through the changes. Um, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you to Ms. Keegan for going through them with the. Um, with the highlighter is super helpful. And also, um, thank you for the clear. I, I just think that they add some nice clarity um, for our families. Um, we had a few families that reached out with questions in the handbook this year. And I really appreciate your um, being able to respond to that in the annual review. Um, and I, I thank you. That makes our job easier. So really appreciate it. One thing that I should point out, because I know there was some concern too with what mm -hmm. took place at the very beginning of the year. Uh, as it res uh, is respecting the the rock, and there was some questions around that. And you know, my feeling is if both males and females, females. to paint the rock, I'm perfectly fine with that. I have no issues with that. I just want to ensure that all participants follow the same line of communication that our students have been following in the past, so that everyone knows if someone's going to participate here's why and here's what we're going to do. Uh, so I just, I thought that was important to just note too that it doesn't really have to be a handbook change because there's no specific language in there saying that it's a, a gender only, female only rock. It just has been what our tradition has been. And honestly, I'm open to anybody and everybody from the student body doing it, as long as they're doing it in a positive manner that is benefiting the whole class. Th thank you. I think that, that makes sense. And I also appreciate that several times in your explanations, you were talking about how there is flexibility. Things are in the handbook, but a lot of times it said, it doesn't say must, it says will or 
you know, should or ought to or whatever it is. And so I know that you try to allow flexibility based on the situation. And I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have great kids and, and there's just a lot of things that come up in different circumstances. So um, please know that I, I understand that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Kellett, do you have anything that you'd like? I, we just had three uh, ads to our handbook. One is uh, an inclusion of the uh, mastery rubrics for mm -hmm. grading in special subjects. And they're, they're gonna continue piloting that. It's been received very well and it's, it's grown through the year. Um, and also World Language is going to be developing their own rubrics um, with the FLESS students coming in. It, it, seems appropriate that they would go to a, a grading system that would be on a proficiency basis. Um, the other piece that we really like teachers, it was well received by everyone, our school council and uh, teachers alike, and that would be the homework guidelines that we've included. And it, it is, uh, there are a number of school districts that have tweaked this in, in its getting to us. And um, we're really excited about it because it lays out what homework is about it uh, reduces the amount of time kid, students are expected to do homework by the grade level. And that is a recommendation from a national teacher uh, group. And it also, you know, teachers responsibilities, students responsibilities, parents, um, expectations we have for parents to help with, with their students work. So we're really excited about that. And the last piece that we are adding is at the end of our handbook would be the guidelines and procedures and guidelines for Chromebooks as we move to the one-to-one -one initiative. I will say that um, I'm, I was looking at it earlier today and on the second to last page is a mention of Flipgrid. We have stopped using Flipgrid, so I would, I think it's near the bottom of that second to last page. I would eliminate that from that section uh, just because of security concerns with the student's information. All right, that's fine. That can be updated for next time um, yeah. when we do vote on it. That's great. And I have to say that you you only have three items, but they're three huge items. Oh, they're, they're so, absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, I did not, I did not, we did move all the times in our handbook to reflect the new start time, but it was moved up the accordingly, you know, by the, I think it's 50, 55 minutes. So I didn't, I didn't. I think that warranted forwarding those on. I think John's were a little more some substantive. Um, okay, thanks. Did anybody have questions? Comments? Uh, Maggie. Uh, oh, sorry, I um, that. Maggie first. Sorry. Uh, just, I want to say thank you so much about the homework. I thought that was a really thoughtful and well done addition. I think that'll be helpful for middle school parents. I have a specific question about the item. It's on page 50 of the packet anyway. Um, regarding um, when students have to pay for the Chromebook. I was under the impression that families were going to be offered a low cost insurance policy that would cover this. I'm a little bit worried that we put these Chromebooks in the hands of 11 year old children um, because, um, you know, they do things that are outside the manufacturer's warranty. Um, how, how are we going to help those families to not have careless children who end up with big bills? I don't think we can avoid having careless children. I think that's just the nature of kids this age. Um, I, if they get the insurance, my understanding is, then that would be covered. Okay. That's my so, understanding. And, and this was done, um, I am working with Mr. Ritaco. Yes, uh, yeah. So I just wanna make sure that when families receive these Chromebooks, cause that is like buried way down at the end. I just wanna just give advice to um, be very, clear with families about what this looks like if they choose not to take the very low cost insurance yes i would agree it, it i would it, that would i would equate to the dc trip this year where where we when we canceled we had the situation for a while where they were only going to get a certain percentage less a certain percentage back so this would be similar to that is you insurance is uh it, it can, it's, there's a cost, but if you need it, there's a reason there's a cost. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Ms. McCoy? 
Uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention um, that this is an important reminder to me that the policies that Lynn and her committee worked so hard on updating and that you all approved last week, we need to make sure that those policies are updated um, in all of your handbooks. So I just jotted a note down to ask Cheryl to make sure those policies come back out to the principals. Obviously, they've already been approved by the, the school committees, so you wouldn't have to reapprove them. I just want to make sure that they end up in the final copy. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, really good point. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you for catching that. Um, any other questions? Okay, so we will vote on those um, next on the handbooks in June. Um, let's move to the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes for December 5th and March 3rd and April 28th? Michael Jaffe, so moved. I hear a second. Uh, a second. Thank you. People are so hesitant to second today. Um, we'll do the vote. Maggie. Maggie Sharon, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Michael. Michael Jaffe, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. And Ann Hovey, yes. Um, Really quickly, I hate to say this, but before we adjourn, um, members of the RSC have indicated that we would really like to have a workshop to discuss committee norms um, and leveraging what we've learned over the past six weeks into better performance in the future, given the current state of affairs. Um, I just want to really quickly check to see if committee members are interested in that, and if so, then we'll take the step forward to yeah. do it. <clears throat> yeah, Judy. I think, that's a, I think that's a fabulous idea. I think we talked about it a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's terrific. I'd like to see us be able to meet as a group and talk about norms. Um, you know, we can do part of it even without wasting the time of, of you know, um, administrators, but we also would be good to set goals um like we didn't we do that last last year around this time and that was really helpful yeah we did I, during the summer yeah yeah I, I just think it for a million reasons it's a great idea yeah i think oh sorry maggie i i'm happy to do i'm happy to do it and certainly make myself available i'm is is this something that i i know the um the last time we just did it internally is this something where we can welcome in our call you know the the school administration and also i just want to keep us in mind that there is an election coming in june so i just don't want you guys us to get you guys us to get too far down the road of setting norms and then should we have new folks joining us or replacing us um, have, I, I don't want to bother the other rest of us if that means we have to do it over again. But I'm um, certainly always, I love, I love norms. <laughs> I thought that makes sense. I, just a little bit of background. Um, this actually came from Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, in part because of things that have arisen just from having Zoom calls and just sort of how we can interact and things that we can and can't seem to get done um, as a committee. So I, I don't foresee it necessarily as being a lengthy meeting. Fortunately, Zoom, quick Zoom meetings are good and they're easy, You're not wasting you know, the 20 minutes to drive there and back. Um, so I, I think that that was the, the thought, um, but that's why I wanted to check with people um, to see if they thought that would make sense. And if so, then we'll try to get something scheduled quickly um, and we'll try to get a, an agenda so everyone can share what their questions are about how we operate differently now given the current set of circumstances um, and and possibly ask our other um, committees and do a joint potentially um, I don't know we'll have to see okay um, all right do I hear a motion to adjourn so moved so moved uh, let's say thank you for all thank you to all of you for the meeting and also thank you to our teachers we love and appreciate you yay yes heart thank you all right yeah all right thank you all and i will see you all soon thank all right. you Bye. thank you everyone Bye. Thank you.